As a governing board member of the International Science Council, which is the largest representative science organization in the world, bringing together the natural and social sciences, and as past president of the International Union of Psychological Science, I welcome you to what promises to be a thought-provoking and timely webinar. The behavioral and other contradictions that this deadly pandemic has laid bare in how we treat of and think, behave, are critical in how we not only mediate the devastating effects of the pandemic, but also how we hopefully reshape our fragile world to become better than the one we leave behind and are currently in. I now invite Craig Calhoun, a renowned sociologist, to facilitate this important webinar. Thank you very much, Seth, for being here and for your leadership um, in psychology internationally and in the International Science Council. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, moderate this. I will try to ensure that there is no radical extremism, that we are all moderate. And um, I should say that uh, I will not attempt to bring very much sociology to this. My role is to be a non-psychologist and thus um, uh, to preside in a way that is not a commitment to any particular version of psychology. Psychology is an enormous field um, that has many different sub-disciplines, many different lines of work. Um, and it would be very hard to say that psychology has one specific view, um, but we are lucky to have of a uh, presenter and panelists who will be able to bring out some of what psychology has learned from the COVID pandemic and the ways in which this matters for psychology. Before we start, let me remind everyone that the webinar is being recorded and live streamed, that participants, including all of you in the audience, can use the Q&A function or the chat function, I'll try to watch both, to pose questions. Um, it's best if you use the Q&A for questions and chat for other kinds of comments and discussions or questions will tend to get lost. If participants have any technical or other issues, they can send a message via Zoom chat to ISC support, which is listed among the various participants to get assistance. Now, um, as I suggested, uh, we have a very distinguished psychologist who represents a broad view of psychology, but I'm going to repeat, there are in fact lots of psychologies. We say a discipline, but it's a very plural field. And our discussants and commentators will bring out some of that plurality, including as it relates to interdisciplinary connections to other academic fields. Stephen Reichler is the Ward Law Professor of Psychology at the University of St. Andrews. He is a fellow of the British Academy and a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And for over 40 years, he has been researching into various aspects of group process and social identity. He's currently on the advisory groups to the UK and the Scottish governments on COVID-19. And he is the co-author of one of the earliest appearing significant um, works on COVID-19. With no further ado, Stephen, over to you. Well, hello uh, to everybody and thank you for inviting me. It's a, a great pl a pleasure and a considerable privilege uh, to be invited to speak to you in these remarkable times. And they're remarkable in many ways, not least for the ways in which scientific debates, which used to be the preserve of the lecture hall and the tutorial room, have become uh, part of popular discourse, part of everyday society. Um, and so nearly everyone now understands and can talk about vox and vuies. Uh, we now debate in our homes uh, matters of spike proteins, convergent evolution. We talk 
um, about lateral flow tests and PCR tests in ways that we used to talk about the football results and the Kardashians. Um, the B117 is no longer the night bus that takes you home. It's now something that keeps you awake worrying at night. So science has become part of popular culture and scientists likewise. Many scientists have become in many ways popular celebrities, better known, uh, certainly better loved than many politicians. Obviously in South Africa, Abdul Karim, in Canada, Bonnie Henry, in uh, Mexico, Hugo lopez Gatel, in New Zealand, um, Susie Wiles, in Scotland, where I'm from, uh, Jason Leach. These are figures who now everybody knows. But perhaps for me as a psychologist, one of the things that is particularly interesting is that it's not just the physical sciences, the life sciences, it's not just virologists and epidemiologists and modelers who've become well known and whose ideas have become important. The same is true of the social sciences. In exactly the same way as in the physical sciences, the things that used to be confined to the academy are now part of popular culture. People uh, will debate about adherence and compliance. They will talk about the social contract and the social bases of trust. I used to say that until a vaccine comes along, virtually every single major intervention we could make about the virus, about COVID, would be behavioral. But I was wrong. Because of course, even now we have a vaccine, still the behavioral issues are at the very core of it. Because a vaccine in and of itself solves nothing. It's people getting vaccinated that makes a difference. And so we have to deal with vaccine hesitancy. We have to deal with the fears. We have to deal with the marginalization. We have to feel, deal with the ways in which different groups perceive vaccines in different ways because of their histories. We have to deal with the vaccine inequities that exist around the world. The behavioral dimension remains absolutely central. And if I may, um, uh, scratch an itch at this point. I, I, I particularly dislike that phrase NPIs, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. It's slightly less offensive than the term non-white, uh, but it still marks as given the pharmaceutical to which the behavioral is other and therefore secondary in some way or another. Uh, and in no way are the behavioral interventions secondary to the pharmaceutical interventions. And if people talk about uh, NPIs, I suggest we retaliate by talking about NBIs, non-behavioral interventions. The point here is that the two go together. It's a partnership that's absolutely critical. And one of the pleasures, there have been few pleasures in the last year, but one of the pleasures has been to sit on committees, on advisory boards with the life scientists, as I say, with the virologists, the public health experts, the mathematicians, the modelers, and act together as a community in which we all learn and respect from each other. So, as I say, there's a remarkable opportunity, I think, in society, and I hope we will sustain it, for people to understand and engage with science in general, both life science and behavioral science. But what I want to do today is to suggest that not only has the pandemic changed the position of science in society and changed the position specifically of behavioral sciences, psychology in society, I want to suggest it has also led us to rethink the dominant models of the human subject, to rethink the nature of psychology certainly that operates within the policy sphere that operates within governments. And I want to contrast two views, one which has been very popular, probably dominant in many governments, which is about the individual as a fragile rationalist, and contrast that with the notion of collective resilience, which I think is one of the most startling and positive features of the whole pandemic. So let me explain what I mean. Let me contrast those two approaches. The notion of the fragile rationalist starts from the premise that the human cognitive apparatus is limited 
And to have a limited cognitive capacity in a complex world, we have to simplify. We have to distort to get by, that these distortions are necessary, but nonetheless, they are distortions. So human beings destroy information. They take information, they distort it. We're not particularly good with complexity. We're not particularly good with uncertainty and ambiguity. And particularly, particularly when we are in situations where we are pressured, particularly when we are in situations of crisis, we crack, we panic, we behave suboptimally, we behave irrationally, we rush for the exits, and trample over each other to get there, thereby turning a crisis into a tragedy. You wouldn't watch a good Hollywood disaster film without having people fleeing to the exits and waving their hands in the air, but in equally, the notion of panic reproduces that idea of suboptimal, irrational, uh, mindless, and counterproductive behavior. And this notion, as I say, I think of the fragile rationalist, is particularly attractive to governments of whatever stripe, of whatever politics, because it justifies the existence of the political. If people are incapable of looking after themselves in a crisis, they clearly need uh, politicians, they clearly need the state to shepherd them. If they are like sheep, they need shepherds and therefore it justifies their existence. I remember for many years, I was involved in advisory uh, bodies to the, uh, to the UK government about what would happen uh, after a terrorist attack. And the, the real difficulty that UK government had was with a scenario where there is a dirty bomb outside Westminster which destroys the government, who are then not there to shepherd us, and therefore would we have to tell people in advance um, what they might do and how they might respond. And, and the British government agonized for so long over this uh, dramatic and to them terribly radical notion that people can look after themselves, uh, that the government changed and the idea went away and nothing ever happened. So that notion, as I say, of the fragile rationalist, of, of people who in a crisis constitute the problem, justifies the existence of uh, a politics which then becomes a paternalistic politics. And in the UK, at least, this idea was very prominent and very significant at the start of the pandemic. So before the first lockdown in the UK, which happened on the 23rd of March, 2020, there was a lot of debate about what was called behavioral fatigue. The notion that people don't have the resilience, don't have the understanding to cope with severe restrictions, and therefore you couldn't impose restrictions too early, because if you did, that people would only be able to uh, go along with them for so long, and therefore, in effect, uh, you would drain the batteries and, and people would stop going along with restrictions and they wouldn't work. So you had to wait for as long as you could before you actually implemented them. And critically, in early March, for a week or two, it was decided not to uh, impose restrictions. And it is argued by the modelers that that might have doubled the death rate in the first wave. In fact, actually, there's a, there's a um, very interesting study that came out in the Lancet today, in fact, which compares uh, countries which acted hard and early with those who don't and shows that they do better in terms of public health, less deaths, they do better in terms of economy, they also do better in terms of civil liberties because strong early action means things that don't drag on. So this notion, this notion of behavioral fatigue, this general notion of the fragile rationalist had real consequences, really did uh, impact lives in a major way. And so the question is, were they right? Are people fragile in this way? Do people lack the qualities, the resilience, the grit, if you like, to put up with severe restrictions? And that question has been asked virtually every day since the 23rd of March. It was asked during the first lockdown in the UK. It was asked after the end of the first lockdown and as we were debating whether to go into a second lockdown in the autumn, would people crack? 
had their time limit run out, would they still adhere? It was asked in the winter, it's still asked now, time and time again, the perception is that the population, the public, are the problem, the weak point, the limit upon what we can actually do. And I would suggest, and I'm going to concentrate on the UK data because I know it best, but there is equally similar data from around the world, that this notion was comprehensively disproved. Early on in the first lockdown in the United Kingdom, there was a study which showed that only over 90% of people were adhering, 46% of them were suffering considerably, but still they were adhering. And if you look at the, the, the monitors that go on, the Office of National Statistics, which puts out statistical bulletins every week or two, then on the things that people are able to do, wearing face masks, socially distancing, um, uh, hygiene and so on, the level of adherence is remarkably high. 80, 90%, even higher. Certain things people don't adhere to, but those tend to be the things where the limit is not psychological, but practical. So self-isolation, if you're infected, has got much lower levels of adherence, but not because people aren't motivated, but because in the UK, we're not giving them enough support to stay at home. Equally in the first wave, studies came out showing that poorer people were three to six times more likely to break lockdown but not because of motivation. Their motivation to stay at home was just as high as high. The limit condition, again, was the ability to stay at home and put food on the table. And this had really profound consequences for the government response because the UK government, at least, adopted a blame narrative which suggested that people were blaming lockdown egregiously because of psychological ill will or psychological weak will. The figures, I think, suggested that actually the problem was not motivational, it was practical. And the government, rather than adopting a blame narrative, should have been far more involved in supporting people to do the right thing. So in the UK, but not just about around the UK, these notions of the public lacking the psychological grit of being fragile were confounded in many ways. Uh, in many ways, the public was not the problem in the pandemic. And in fact, viewing them as the problem actually alienated the public from government, undermined the relationship between the two and undermined the trust that existed. So why is this? Why didn't we find what was expected in terms of um, uh, psychological weakness, perhaps even panic? Now, in some ways, what happened didn't come as a surprise to those who studies crises and emergencies. Because despite the image of panic, despite the assumption of panic, panic is actually very hard to find. Most emergencies, people don't trample over others to get the exits, quite the opposite. What you tend to find is that people stay with others, they won't leave others behind. They will go at the pace of the slowest in their group. That people support each other characteristically, put their lives at risk characteristically. And if people die, often they die because they are supporting others. They are staying behind to look after others. That's true of some of the most significant disasters of our time. 9-11, of course, is iconic. And we all remember those remarkable pictures of firefighters running into the Twin Towers to save people just before the Twin Towers come down. That remarkable behavior. And in no way would I question the bravery, the remarkable behavior, but at the same time, did it help? Because what they found was not that people were panicking and helpless and needing the state to look after them, people were self-organizing. They were helping each other. They were guiding each other down the stairs and potentially the firefighters got in the way more than actually helped. Again, in the UK, we had our 9-11 on a smaller scale because we we're only Britain, we're not the United States, but we had our bombings of the 7th of July, 2005. One of the bombings was on an underground train. And the firefighters, again, with remarkable bravery, went through the underground tunnels to get to the stricken train 
expecting to find people in complete disarray, panicking. What they found was people remarkably organized, helping support each other, supporting each other, showing triage, sometimes using uh, elementary first aid skills if they had them, if they didn't, um, uh, psychological support. Even though most people there didn't know whether there was another bomb and they were going to die or not. And the firefighters were bemused by this and noted that in many ways the first responders in the emergency weren't the emergency services. They were people themselves, self-organizing, supporting each other. So the question is why? What does that tell us about human psychology? What's going on? Well, there are a number of explanations. The first explanation of, 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 of these types of behavior were, were evolutionary explanations. People look after kin, and indeed they do. But they don't just have look after kin. So the second explanation was much more um, interactional, based on interpersonal bonds. Uh, people look after friends uh, and acquaintances who they know. And indeed, people look after kin, and they look after friends, and they look after acquaintances. But that's not all who they look after. People look after complete strangers. People sacrifice themselves to complete strangers. So why is that? And the work, some of which I've done, um, some of which my colleague, John Drury, uh, the University of Sussex has done, and many others have done now, suggests that what happens in an emergency is an emergent sense of shared identity. That because there is common fate, common experience, we face common dangers, we begin to think of ourselves in terms of uh, the collective rather than the individual, in communal rather than individualistic terms. We think in terms of we rather than I. And the emergence of this sense of shared identity, defining on the self on that collective level, is absolutely crucial because there is a range of psychological evidence coming from uh, the social identity tradition, so-called, which emerged uh, in the 1970s uh, in Bristol, uh, in the UK, where I was lucky enough to be an undergraduate at the time, suggesting that the self this foundational concept in psychology needs to be seen in much richer terms than is conventionally the case. That the self can be defined at the level of I versus you, but it can also be defined at the level of we versus they. And when we transition from personal identity to social identity, when we define ourselves in terms of our group memberships, our social category memberships, then all the self processes which we normally talk about have to be rethought. The self of self interest is a collective self. And therefore what happens to other group members impacts on my own self interest, my own sense of what is important and what isn't uh, important, my own calculations of cost and benefit. And I want to argue that this sense of shared identity is fundamental to understanding at least three core aspects of the pandemic. Uh, and then I will go on and make a few comments about how it's created and how it's undermined uh, and uh, what the significance of that uh, may be. The first thing is adherence, question of adherence. Now, Many people assume that if you think in terms of self-interest premised on the individual self, that there wasn't very good reason for a lot of people to adhere. Um, in the next door room here, I have a 16 year old um, son. Well, he was 16 year old uh, when the pandemic started. He's 17 now. And for him, the risks of going out as an individual were pretty low. He was unlikely to get infected. If he got infected, he was unlikely to get too uh, ill. On the other hand, the costs of staying at home with his tedious elderly parents was very high indeed. And if he did the cost benefit analysis as an individual, then the logic would have been for him to stay at home. But he and millions of others didn't. 
what they did is they thought about the collective self and they thought about the cost to the community if they go out. And once you think about the collective self, then the calculation changes fundamentally. If you go out, you endanger, you may even kill some of the most vulnerable in your community. So viewed in terms of we rather than I, the underlying calculations, the very notion of costs and benefits changes fundamentally. And there is now a wealth of evidence to show us the importance of that sense of shared identity um, on adherence. Early on, some work from the London School of Economics showed that the key issue in determining whether people broke lockdown or not was not um, individual considerations, it was a sense of belonging to the community and wanting the community to come out of it well together. Um, Jay Van Bavel, who is one of the discussants, led uh, a remarkable study. He will correct me I, I, uh, if, if I get the details wrong, but if I remember, it was something like 67 countries and 46,000 people showing one of the key determinants of adherence was a sense of national identity, but not national identity in the sense of my country right or wrong, flag-waving, jingoistic nationalism, but just simply a sense of connection to others in the national community. And there are a number of other studies which show exactly the same thing. A recent study showing that leadership, which creates a sense of community, is critical and explains levels of adherence in different countries. And Andrew Cuomo put this rather nicely, unfortunately um, now disgraced, but still he was quite right when he said this. Early on, some people were talking to him about not wanting to do this, not wanting to do that. I don't want to wear a mask. I don't want to stay distant. He said, look, he said, this isn't about I, it's about we. Because what you do affects others. So he said, get your head around the we concept. And I think he's quite right. Get your head around the we concept. And that's what psychology needs to do. And if we presuppose that psychologically people disconstrue themselves at an individual level only, we completely fail to be able to address those issues and fail to be able to address the different levels at which we define the self and therefore all self-related terms, whether it be self-esteem, uh, self-efficacy, or indeed self-interest. As I say, the self of self-interest needs to be problematized and indeed is being problematized by certain very prominent uh, um, economists such as George Akerlof and his work on identity uh, economics. What, what counts as a good um, is in relationship to the way in which the self is defined. So that's the first dimension adherence. The second dimension is solidarity. Because one of the things we've discovered is that in a crisis of this order, the state can never provide enough. The state is necessary, but it can't do all the things that are needed to do to check up on the elderly to see if they're okay. Um, to find out if people need food delivered, to help people out in the myriad ways which are necessary in the midst of this pandemic. It can help in those regards, but it can't do all that work itself. And we've seen a remarkable flourishing of mutual support and mutual aid during the pandemic. Sometimes it takes very informal forms. People, as I say, just checking the, the, the neighbor next door, checking on elderly people to see if they're okay, seeing if somebody needs food delivered, seeing if somebody needs their dog walked, whatever it might be. Sometimes it takes slightly more formal uh, 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 manifestations in, uh, in, in WhatsApp groups, which bring together people at a street level or a community level. Sometimes it's mutual aid groups, but the level of it is quite remarkable. I was... I was looking at this the other day. I discovered that at the beginning of the pandemic, um, 170 community action networks were formed in Cape Town alone within two months. Um, in Tunisia, uh, Facebook groups, vast Facebook group, uh, 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 group books with over 100,000 people in them grew up um, in Iran. 
volunteers delivered 70,000 respirators and other PPE um, uh, that were needed. Um, in the UK, we had over 4,000 mutual aid groups growing up involving over 12 million people. So about a third of the adult population involved in these types of things, a remarkable flowering of solidarity. And one of the fundamental findings from social identity work is that when people consider themselves in collective terms, when they look at their interests at the level of the group, then they are more likely to be concerned for, empathic with, and to help and support other members of the groups who are in need. Because again, this is not a matter of the abnegation of the self. It's not a matter of denying self-interest. It's a matter of extending the self. So the self of self-interest encompasses others. They become part of the same moral universe as ourselves and we become impelled to support them in the same way. So again, social identity processes, and at the moment I'm involved in a, a project looking at a number of dimensions of group processes in COVID, and um, you see the importance of that sense of community, that sense of we, that sense of the collective, or the growth of these forms of solidarity. And here, I come to the notion of collective resilience. For a number of years, um, I and a number of other colleagues used to study one of the most remarkable events in the world, probably the biggest collective event in the world, which is the Kum Mela in Allahabad in Northern India. It's a Hindu festival, happens every year. People go to the banks of the Ganges, the confluence of the Ganges and the Yamuna River for a month, for a month for this Hindu festival. And every year, several million ago and it's on a religious cycle of 12 years every six years the Ard Mela about 20 million people go and every 12 years up to 120 million people go over the month and on a single day a single day you can have 25 million people assembled it is quite remarkable it is quite incredible uh, as an event but one of the things that we discovered in studying it was that the common experience, intense experience of being part of this collectivity leads to a very powerful sense of shared identity. And that very powerful sense of shared identity gives you a sense of being supported by others. And that allows you to cope with difficult situations. So to take a simple example, most of the people at the Mela are in their 60s, 70s, 80s. The average age is 64, the modal age is over 70. And three times a day, they have to bathe in the Ganges, the first before dawn. And at that time of year, January, February, it can be very cold. The water can be icy. These people are frail. The water um, can have strong currents. The bottom of the river is uneven. They fear they might fall. They might die. They might drown. But they don't fear. Because while those things might happen to them if they were on their own, not only are there others around, they can count on the support of others. They presuppose the support of others and therefore that gives them a sense of resilience. What is more, and I think this is quite a remarkable finding, we find that the Mela, despite the fact that in many ways you would have thought it would be very bad for your health, it's extremely crowded, extremely unhygienic, extremely noisy, all things that are bad for health, we find that overall health is improved, well-being is improved, mental and physical well-being is improved, mass Gatherings in many ways are a health intervention. So why? Again, because this sense of shared identity it gives you a sense of a community and that others will support you. That increases coping and lowers stress, which in turn feeds into physical and mental health. So resilience isn't an individual quality. It's not something in the individual. It's something that occurs between people 
when they have a sense of shared identity. And I would argue that's what we found in this pandemic. People have been resilient to the extent that shared identity has emerged. That's what give them, has given them their resilience. Not as individuals, as individuals, you can't explain this phenomenon. It is to be explained by understanding the collective nature of selfhood, or at least when that collective uh, understanding of selfhood emerges. Now, the third factor I want to talk about is in a sense to reverse what I've been talking about. You all know the old song with the line, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And I think that's been very true of this pandemic. One of the big mistakes we made was to talk early on about social distancing. Now we don't want to social distance. We want to physically distance because being physically proximate can spread the infection and can kill. But being socially distant equally is remarkably bad for our physical and our mental health. We've discovered the costs of isolation. There's been a pandemic of mental health problems. I was looking at one review last from last November, 80 studies um, showing the effects of, uh, of isolation on mental health problems. Again, in the UK alone, it's been estimated by the president of the Royal Society of Psychiatrists that over 10 million people are going to have mental health problems. Not all due to isolation, a lot to do because of the trauma of the disease itself, but a lot to do with isolation. And one of the things that we discover is a sense of groupness is a prophylactic against that sense of isolation. There is some wonderful work under the uh, title The Social Cure, uh, led by a group in Queensland, Kath Haslam, Leonardo Yetten, Alex Haslam, Tegan Chris, which shows that seeing yourself as a member of a social group, being connected, not at, simply at the level of interpersonal bonds, as a lot of the so social capital work suggests, but simply conceptualizing yourself as a member of a group is a really powerful prophylactic against physical and mental ill health. Just a couple of examples. If when you retire, you lose two social group memberships, occupational group membership, perhaps a club that you had through work, you have a 16% chance of dying within the next two years. If, however, you join two new groups, you join um, uh, a walking club, a painting club, whatever it might be, your chances of dying within the next two years are 0.5%. If at 70, you are a member of several social groups, you, uh, on average, you have the, uh, the cognitive capacities of a 60 year old. If you belong to no social groups, you have the cognitive capacities of an 80 year old. So the group we discover is very much a prophylactic against ill health, that the collective is good for us. It allows us to adhere to the things that keep us safe. It gives us the resilience to be able to live with those restrictions. It protects us psychologically. So the group I'm trying to argue, and that collective understanding of the subject is a critical uh, intellectual resource, but a critical practical resource during the pandemic. Now, I've talked about the emergence of shared identity in a pandemic, in a crisis. It happens in many crises, but it's always fragile. It's not guaranteed. And one of the questions is how do we nurture it and what undermines it? Now, a number of factors obviously are critical, and this is a huge question, and I, I, I don't have the time here um, to answer this, this huge question about how do we nurture shared identity? How do we nurture this sense of, uh, uh, um, of collectivity, of social identity that I've spoken about? Uh, in many ways, uh, what I wanted to do is simply put that as a key question on the table to stress how important that is and why we need to answer this question of how do we uh, nurture it as opposed to undermine it. Critically, leadership is really important. Again, the recent study um, shows that 
what we call identity leadership, leadership which leads people to see themselves as part of a community, which builds a sense of shared identity, um, is really impactful in terms of outcomes. In countries where there's been good identity leadership, um, have had better outcomes as mediated by uh, the sense of shared identity. So partly it's rhetorical, partly it's talking about people collectively, but of course it's practical as well. If I had to go into my favorite quotes of the pandemic, one of them would come from Bonnie Henry, the chief medical officer in Vancouver, where she spoke about the fact that, yes, we're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. Some in luxury cruise liners, some in sinking rowboats. And if you want a common experience in order to have shared identity, you've got to do something to overcome those differences. You've got to have the economic schemes which allow people to stay at home during lockdown um, if, they can't, uh, uh, if they can't work from home. You've got to have those economic types of programs. You've got to deal with the huge inequalities which have been so central in this pandemic uh, on every single level. I mean, it's a pandemic of inequalities. <coughs> you die if you're more exposed. You're more exposed if you're poorer, uh, if uh, you work in public facing jobs, if you have to go on public transport, if you live, live in crowded housing. So certainly those material factors are absolutely critical. But so too is a leadership which understands the importance of we, which talks in terms of we, which nurtures positive relationships between people, which urges people not to blame each other and to uh, spy on each other to see if they're violating uh, regulations, but which urges people to understand and support and help their neighbours in order to go through uh, this pandemic. And I stress this because I want to make it very clear that in talking about the positive potential of the group, I don't want to be Pollyannish about this and suggest that the group can only do good things. Actually, the research on groups uh, comes from the fact that groups do very bad things. Um, contemporary social psychology very much came out of the Nazi Holocaust, very much came out of largely Jewish scholars asking the question of why were people murdered in their millions not because of anything they'd done or said, but simply because of the groups they belong to. Clearly, terrible things can happen in groups. And also historically, we know that can happen in pandemics as well. If you go back to the Black Death, of course, Jewish people were blamed for the Black Death, uh, for poisoning the wells. Huge levels of anti-Semitism during the Black Death, over 2,000 Jewish communities destroyed on St. Valentine's Day, February the 14th, 1349 in Strasbourg, 2,000 Jewish people burnt to death. So the point is this, it's not only about building a group, a sense of shared identity, but an inclusive group, an inclusive group that involves the whole population, whereby um, you know, the we is, extends throughout the community. Once you turn that into a we and they, either by not supporting shared identity or still worse, by suggesting that certain other groups are the problem, are to be blamed, are to be pathologized, are the cause of the threat to us, to our health, to our lives, then you really do have the dangers of going from the group as being a positive asset to the group and intergroup conflict being the problem. In many ways, uh, I often talk about um, uh, groups a bit like dynamite, immensely powerful, sometimes powerful for construction, for building, for supporting each other, sometimes critical for destruction. So we need, and I just want to finish with this, we need, I think, to move away from this individualistic notion of the fragile rationalist to understand the critical issue of how we develop a sense of shared identity, <coughs> of how we transform what happens between us, because it is between us that we will deal with the pandemic, but also to be aware that these processes that we're dealing with, these processes that have such power to bring people together, to empower them, to make them resilient, 
also have the potential to divide, to cause conflict, uh, even to cause uh, death between groups. Um, and so understanding the power of groups and understanding the underlying processes of social identity and how to build it and not to break it down, to me, become absolutely key questions for our society as well as for our psychology. And I will finish with that. Stephen, thank you very much. That was a truly wonderful and rich talk that lived up not only to the charge to explore psychology, but to explore the significance of psychological issues, and at the same time, to give us some new perspective on some of this. <clears throat> Let me just draw out a couple of things that um, Stephen emphasized as we turn this to the respondents. Uh, one is simply the complexity of human beings and the uh, um, how much that complexity results from being embedded in culture and social relations, though not only that, and the problems and misperceptions created by simplistic notions of fragile individual rationalists and perhaps other simplistic notions. The importance of groupness and community, and collective identity as psychological variables, but embedded in larger structures. Um, these are crucial to resilience, Stephen showed. They're emergent sometimes, but they're also ongoing in various ways and potentially uh, subject to nurture and steering. And uh, I think this is a question that Stephen opens to the panel and discussions. How can and should that be done? Um, very briefly, he mentioned, and I want to underscore, the importance of what we might think of as infrastructures, that all of this takes place in context. You mentioned things like housing, um, but the ways in which community is shaped by the material conditions for community as well. Um, the importance of leadership, and uh, he kindly, given what we've often heard in public discourse recently, didn't say politics, but I think the significance of the ways in which politics can either shape and nurture or get in the way of resilience, producing polarization and that we-they identity that he talked about, um, and the importance of shaping the power of groups, which can be deployed in different ways. In all of this, I think Stephen made clear the terrific contributions psychology makes on its own but also as an important participant in interdisciplinary science, social science, biomedical science, life sciences, interdisciplinary science of various different domains and in policy and public discourse. So this really shows psychology like the human self to be embedded um, in a variety of different relationships and contexts um, and way enabled to contribute to our collective lives through all of this. Now we have three discussants and I'm going to introduce them all at the beginning and then proceed uh, to call on each of them. And then there will be a chance for Stephen to answer briefly for audience questions and for um, a final bit of discussion from Stephen and the panelists. Let me encourage the audience to use the Q&A function to give us questions. The first discussant is Rivka Wehausen uh, who is the Managing Director of the University of Strasbourg Institute for Advanced Study. She is at once um, a psychologist and an economist, and I think to some extent an intellectual historian and an observer of these fields as well. Um, and she has written significantly on uh, psychological factors in the economy, including ideas like mental capital. Um, and she has uh, pursued a variety of engagements in broader societal and public contexts, as well as in academic research. Um, Shanaz Sufla, our second discussant, is Associate Professor in the Institute for Social and Health Sciences, the University of South Africa. Shanaz's research interests draw from the intersections of 
of decolonial African community and peace psychologies. I think here exemplifying some of the kinds of embeddedness of psychology in different social contexts that we were just talking about. Um, this uh, is shaped by liberatory philosophies and epistemologies, as well as by scientific research. And she has done a great deal of this with a focus on health and well being interventions in the context of structural and epistemic violence, participatory engagement, um, and Africa centered approaches to research, knowledge production, and training. She is also the president elect of the Psychological Society of South Africa. Um, last but not least, uh, Jay Van Bavel, who has already alluded to in Stephen's remarks for some of his research very directly re relevant to COVID and collective resistance, is Associate Behavior of Psychology and Neural Science at New York University. He is the director of the Social Identity and Morality Lab and the author of The Power of Us, Harnessing Our Shared Identities to Improve Performance, Increase Cooperation, and Promote Social Harmony. And during the last year of the pandemic, he has been studying the determinants, determinants of collective behavior in this context. So let me call on uh, Rivka for the first engagement. Thank you. I'm unmuted. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for this very inspiring uh, talk that we just heard from Steve. Uh, there's so much I would like to say about it, but of course I should limit myself. So what I did is I noted down some points uh, on, on in PowerPoint, which I will share with you, because I hope that that will make it more uh, focused, what I would all like to, to say. So I'm going to do that now. So there we go, I hope. So yeah, I think for me, the crucial message that I heard uh, just now, but also in, in the document that I had the chance to look at before is that uh, it matters a lot which model of man you use uh, in policy making. Uh, so the example given was a, a model of a fragile, rational, individualistic, fragilely rational, individualistic, uh, um, person or, or actor versus a social and resilient actor. And, uh, you know, if you take the first model uh, as, your, as your starting point, you will develop very different policy than uh, when you take the, the second model. Um, so it, it matters a lot which model you use because well, it should be accurate enough, of course, because otherwise you're going to make policy which will not work, which will not be effective. Um, uh, but there's something more which I picked up in 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 your um, in your presentation. Uh, the model you use and the policy that you build on it changes the human actor. So the model of the human actor changes the very thing that it's you know it's trying to to represent. Uh, so it's a bit of a self-fulfilling um, yeah, dynamic uh, in that. So if you make policy for uh, some sort of individual panicky person who thinks I don't want to stay inside, and if you if you stress enforcement, you know people are not going to do it, so we have to enforce and so on. You you activate a different element in the human actor than if you make policy that stresses that we're all in this together and we we we. Uh, you know we're we're gonna we're gonna handle this and so on and so forth and we're gonna help you and we trust you to do the right thing and so on. So um, if if that's true, then then the model of man in policy is not just an, an issue of accuracy, but it's an issue also of an, an act that you uh, do when you develop uh, and and execute your policy. Uh, so the, the question, you know, if, if you're a person who stays at home because of the pandemic, are you a good citizen or are you actually a sucker who stays at home and while well, everyone else is having fun? Um, it matters. The behavior is the same. The person can be the same, but the policy can activate the citizen or the, well, the sucker. Um, that's that's your, your self-perception then. So um, just very briefly, there's, of course, research showing that indeed you can activate uh, by priming identity of people, you can activate all kinds of things. If you make people aware of their social status, uh, they act very differently and perform also very differently than if you do not make them aware of it. 
uh, if you put on people a doctor's coat, a, a white doctor's coat, um, they act differently and perform differently than when you don't do that or when you put a white coat on them and you say it's a painter's coat. So there's all kinds of very interesting uh, experiments that show uh, how, how the wide range uh, of uh, being uh, a person can be, how you can trigger uh, a human actor in very different ways um, by, by framing and, and that's of course what policy also does. Um, so the second thing, so the first thing is, you know, the model makes demand, that's then one message I picked up. The second thing is you reap what you sow. So if, if I understand it well, um, Steve argues that policy actually has effects on uh, the people, on human actors. And uh, for example, it might make that they don't trust each other anymore because they're, you know, they're, uh, they're triggered as being this individualistic uh, cost benefit creatures. Um, and they may look at their neighbors seeing that they go out, they say, hey, they go out, well, how can they do that? Um, and this, this might actually erode social relations. Now, um, that's of course bad in a pandemic, um, but this might be an effect that's, that sticks around later. And of course, in, in economics, uh, economists are, of course, always very um, interested in to see what makes an economy work well, what, what brings you know, economic growth and so on and so forth. And over the past decades, they've been looking more and more into the more intangible factors in the economy. For example, social capital is lots of research showing that social relationships and trust and so on and so forth are very important and really can make or break an economy. Um, and if COVID-19 policy, if, if the policy for the pandemic erodes trust and maybe social capital, uh, that might actually have an effect on the economy. Um, now, this is, of course, um, something that you could investigate and study and so on and so forth. But it, I, I mentioned this to give an example that policy making, uh, you know, even if it's in a health domain, and you know, it has in principle nothing to do with the, with the economy, uh, can have effects on the economy um, that, that that matter and that may stick around after uh, the whole pandemic is, is over. Now, the mental health effects have been mentioned also, that the, the way you make policy, if you make people very stressed and distrustful, uh, can, can have real mental health effects and that also matters for their economic behavior. So every policy is based on an explicit or implicit model of, of man and um, I, what I what I get from Steve is that social identity is is a force in society, or maybe a form of capital, if you want to put it in more economic uh, terms, is something very valuable, and it's not being uh, optimized at, in this moment by policy and policymakers who use psychological models um, that do not nurture this, but that might actually uh, diminish this. So I was wondering if we should argue for a psychological impact assessment of policy, that we should actually look at policy, just like we do an environmental impact assessment, that we should see if we should do that also for psychological impacts. Um, we could argue for that also from an economic perspective, because if, if this also has effects on the economy, and, and we know it does, um, then you know it's worth it uh, to do this. Um, so the last thing, uh, mind the model and model the mind. Now, in economics, and I'm involved in, in a number of discussions, um, in economics, there's a great concern about the quality and the validity of, of the models. So uh, economists, of course, are aware that their models were not great in predicting crisis and, and all, all kinds of things. Oh, sorry. Can you go away, please? <laughs> sorry, I'm being... <laughs> I'm working from home, like everyone. So, um, uh, where was I? So, yeah... The, they are they're concerned because they know that their models were really not very good in predicting the financial crisis at the time, and they also don't give many uh, many uh, yeah inspiration much inspiration for for what to do in COVID and how how to recover from COVID. So there's a whole lot of activity going on about new economic thinking, um, transformational economics, and so on and so forth how to get new models and so on. Uh, one, one important uh, line of thought is, is that the human actor should be revised. Uh, so you see models with, where the actors have bounded rationality or they're driven by heuristics. Uh, so you see psychological, uh, yeah, psychological features entering into economic thinking to, to get a more, um, yeah, 
uh, cognitively or mentally plausible uh, actor. Um, but this doesn't solve it. So you might get a more reasonable, realistic actor. Uh, but what still is lacking is that the actor itself might be a variable. Uh, because what, what was shown by Steve is actually that people are not one thing. Uh, you can activate certain selves uh, in, in the people and policy is doing that. So uh, in, in a way, there's some sort of endogenuity uh, in, in policy. And um, it, it's the, the, the individual himself is, is not a constant. Um, so, yeah, um, I think economics really needs psychology to, to develop more reasonable models of man uh, and to also deal with this aspect of, of yeah, reflexivity, I think it's called in, in sociology, that uh, your human actor is a variable in itself. Uh, and if you change, if you make changes in social capital or the mental capital, uh, this actor will behave differently and your model, you know, will have to take that into account. So that's, that's the remarks I would like to make. And um, thanks again. I will stop sharing my screen. Okay. Thank you very much, Rivka. And without a pause, um, let us go on to Shanaz Sufla. Shanaz? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you, yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you so much to the International Science Council and of course the International Union of Psychological Science for the invitation to serve as discussant to your address, Professor Reicher. Um, let me begin with an acknowledgement of those who have uh, been affected in all kinds of ways from COVID and certainly uh, those who have passed from COVID. Professor Reicher, I thought that your articulation of the two psychologies of the pandemic offers us a really incisive analysis of how individual and collective psychologies um, come to be constructed, come to be contested, how they bend and they move in times of crisis, and how, as you pointed out, um, statist and social discourses contribute to the production of individual blame and responsibility, and we've certainly seen so much of this. Um, across contexts and um, what shared identity and shared reality may look like in service of survival. And in so doing then you have for me raised really, really critical questions about um, psycho the psychosocial and psychopolitical considerations in makings and the enactments of psychologies in context of human catastrophe. Um, and of course, by implication, psychology's epistemic contributions, applications, um, engagements beyond its own borders um, at this time of crisis, at this time of ongoing structural injustices and, and disaster capitalism. So thank you very much for your excellent contribution. And in the spirit of plur plurality, as Professor Calhoun um, noted, I want to um, offer my response from the locus of my practice as a community psychologist um, located in South Africa. And so my response is really to engage with your address from a parallel and hopefully converging vantage point as a way to stretch our insights and our responses to the pandemic. And I really, really want to reference here um, the politics of suffering and the politics of care as possibly one way, my way, of thinking about some of what you have shared. Um, most immediately what comes to mind, Mr. George Floyd's last words, I can't breathe, which embodies very powerfully a discursive representation of, of the interlocking oppressions that have rendered certain lives disposable, more disposable than others, um, less worthy of the claim to resources to support health and um, uh, safety and human flourishing. Um, and then a piece uh, uh, published by Arundhati Roy yesterday, in which she refers to this epic catastrophe in India, 
as an outright crime against humanity. She writes that um, the system has not collapsed, the system barely existed. And in Africa, um, like elsewhere in other parts of the world, where coloniality, which is uh, what endures past colonialism, forecloses uh, choices and forecloses liberties. For so many, as we know, the question, and you said this, um, the question is not about whether one lives or dies. It's about whether you will die from, from the virus or from starvation or from police brutality. This, for me, um, is the psychology of oppression which sits beside the psychology of liberation. And since, as we know, the pandemic is more than a biomedical crisis, these are critical psychologies with which I see other psychologies of the pandemic interacting, uh, you know, conversation to be had within our discipline. And so as a counterpoint to the narrow and more individualized notions of suffering, that tend to see the historical and the social um, and, the, and the material bracketed off. The question for us all is, how may we draw from such perspectives and the intersections between these, um, as you say, to broaden our understandings and our responses within the context of compound suffering uh, at this time? Um, I turn to what you said about the psychology of community resilience, precisely because in this crisis, we must trouble the concept of resilience to the extent that it places the emphasis of, um, on individuals or on individual responsibility for suffering and for care. I, I like your framing of the capacities of the collective as a resource and as a source of critical support. And of course, as a counter, to the discourse of the so-called ignorant or, or unknowing other. And this emphasis on, on the collective immediately, for me and I'm sure for, for you, Sats, brings to mind the African notion of Ubuntu, meaning a, a person is a person through other persons, a philosophy that um, talks to the, the idea of being in relation, the, the we consciousness and the joint action that you talked about. And certainly uh, in our respective contexts, we have seen extraordinary expressions of care and solidarity inspired by, by Ubuntu. And as you said, but what when Ubuntu or collective resilience is not harnessed and not buttressed by systemic support and by structural change? Um, so that the already burdened are left more burdened. So when the news headline here screams very dramatically that Ubuntu will save South Africa from COVID-19, it is understandably met with, with deep anger by especially those who have lived in catastrophe long before the, the pandemic. And so here I would like to invite us to think about the knowledge and practices of collective resilience born not only in adversity, but also in resistance and refusal. So nuanced forms of what may be, may be a kind of rehumanizing defiance that at face value may look like mere non-adherence possibly, but that may in fact be towards the kinds of things we are talking about, survival and dignity and agency and the radical hope and the material justice and gender justice and social justice and certainly a call for a humanizing ethics in state and uh, other responses to COVID. And this brings me to my final point. Your call for what I read as a new politics of care in this pandemic that invites us to rethink state and society relations. I, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, community and liberation psychologists, for example, frame the politics of care around the crisis of care and the need for liberatory ethics of care. Both bring into focus notions of justice and point out the asymmetries in power and resources, importantly, the feminization and the racialization of care labor, 
but also interdependence, resistance, resilience, um, and really the imperative to build uh, solidarities and alliances and partnerships. And so a caring politics talks to building institutions, uh, as we're saying, at multiple levels um, that widen who we care for, how we care, and, and to what end. And so, Professor Reichert, the model, what you're talking about then, certainly, yes, requires us to mobilize our, our insights into the multiple psychologies of the pandemic. And we need to do this to advocate for, for generative, collaborative, participatory responses, policy and otherwise, to the crisis for broad and deep support and for reversing what some people um, have called the tyranny of carelessness. And of course, as you suggest, um, we would do very well to do so through engagements that um, across both horizontal and vertical axes that transgress disciplinary and other boundaries. And, and the discipline of psychology really, really has to do thing, has to do this, as you were saying, to rethink our dominant frames. Um, so that pandemic praxis integrates the knowledges and the practi practices of multiple social partners, um, including the thinking and doing that takes place at the local level, um, well beyond the academy and our consulting uh, and our consulting rooms. And with that, I take strong heed of your caution, and I really appreciate this important point that you make that. Um, that even as we think about the psychologies of the pandemic, that we should not psychologize what are clearly not matters of psychology so much, uh, but of structure, of history, um, and so on. To conclude, uh, if we are to agree with what Arundhati Roy said in a different piece, um, that the pandemic is a portal, and if we are to think about the pandemic and its psychologies, alongside humanizing and liberatory ethics and economies of care, then certainly, Professor Reicher, your contribution today offers us a most necessary um, set of ethical, um, psychosocial, and psychopolitical challenges. And I thank you for this. Thank you. Shanaz, thank you as well for excellent comments. And we turn now to Jay Ben Pavel. Thank Jay? you. Um, as, a, as always, it's a pleasure hearing from Steve. Uh, I always learn something every time I listen to him and the commentaries were fantastic. So uh, thank you for enlightening me about many of these issues. Um, what I wanna talk about is uh, in many ways, underscoring things that I think are, are incredibly important and right about what Steve said about the pandemic. Um, at the top of his talk, he talked about the need for elevating our understanding of behavioral science and specifically the work that we do on collective behavior or, or the we as opposed to the I. And in my view, it's quite possible that we have just undergone the biggest behavior change experiment in human history. Uh, within weeks of the pandemic spreading, um, entire countries were shut down. Uh, we were radically forced to change our behavior in dramatic ways, in ways that were incredibly counterintuitive to human nature. Uh, by cutting off contact with close others, uh, by engaging in pro-sociality, by distancing ourselves from people. Uh, many of these things that go very much against uh, everything we've done, all our practices and habits, and, and potentially even our evolutionary ancestry. Um, and so I think we need to really lean into the importance of behavioral science going forward. And what that means is that we need well-funded, robust research. In the same way that we support research on vaccines, and uh, we, right now we're starting to see the incredible payoff of that, um, we need to support that same type of work, like similar to large clinical trials on behavioral interventions to understand how we can mobilize collective behavior. I saw some of the questions in the, in the chat were, how can we do this? Um, we have clues and hints and, and a large literature, um, but we don't have the type of scalable solutions that we have uh, for example, in clinical trials of vaccines. And so we need a crisis science for collective action. And just to put it in context, where I am in the US, the country here spent over $12 billion on vaccine development, um, but we're now already starting to hit a wall of vaccine hesitancy. 
And uh, the number of jabs we're giving each week, each day has started to decrease in part because we're hitting this wall of people who are reluctant or resistant or don't trust it. Um, and we have spent virtually nothing on this issue. And so the continuation of the pandemic, not only in this country, but other countries, hinges critically on getting the behavioral science right and laying the foundations. Um, and I think this is money well spent, not just in the current pandemic, but uh, this week, scientists develop a new vaccine that seems to be, uh, I believe, 77% of effective for malaria, uh, which kills hundreds of thousands of people a year around the world. And so having a science, uh, a deal at the rigorous type of science analogous to the work that we do for the development of vaccines on behavioral science around vaccine hesitancy uh, would pay off in terms of tens of thousands, if not more, uh, of lives. Um, and we need to lay the foundations in advance of the next crisis. Um, because when a crisis hits, as we found out with this current pandemic, we didn't have time to run a ton of studies on the current pandemic. Uh, political actors, countries, politicians, agencies and institutions had to act almost instantaneously uh, with very minimal knowledge, a lot of uncertainty and mobilize collective action. Um, and so they were able to do it somewhat through uh, policies, but as we're discussing today, uh, there are holes in our understanding or how economic policy interacts with behavioral science. And so I think that's where Steve's talk uh, underscores some really critical insights about what we've learned and what we need to know more about. Um, the first one is, again, this interaction between economics or political policy and psychology and behavioral science. So if we're gonna understand what promotes collective resilience, it's critical to understand, um, are people getting the economic support they need if so, then you create the conditions for resilience to flourish. Um, or as we heard in the last commentary, thinking about economic inequality and oppression are critical barriers to collective resilience and abidance by uh, public health guidelines. And so if we don't take these uh, economic factors and policy factors uh, in, in interaction with psychology and behavioral science, we're gonna have an impoverished understanding of what we can do to get people to engage in the right type of behaviors. And so that's going to require interdisciplinary work and understanding things at multiple levels of analysis. Um, the other thing I want to underscore here is that the way that the government, and especially I think many outlets in the media, have uh, done misrepresents collective behavior, as, as Steve mentioned. Uh, there is very high support for most of these public health guidelines. Um, the reasons why people are not abiding by it are often due to the lack of support they get. Uh, uh, holes or problems with specific policies. Um, but what happens when we present people with endless news stories about people who are breaking the guidelines, or uh, I remember last summer there were endless uh, images in the media of people at beaches. It turns out that beaches are incredibly safe because the primary mechanism of transmission of COVID is um, aerosol. And so a lot of the ways that they were presenting behavior as violating guidelines or uh, willfully ignoring them uh, in cases where they had no choice, but they needed to work um, or where it was actually a safe environment as opposed to being indoors in a small place in a large crowd um, has given the creation of false norms about adherence and creates an illusion about why people do or do not adhere um, and whether they're doing so in, in alignment with public health guidelines. And there's research on social norms, which is that people look towards norms to determine how to behave. And if the media is presenting an image of people who are violating the guidelines, even if that's incredibly rare, it's likely to nudge them to violate the guidelines themselves. Um, and this is, I, there was a recent uh, article, a headline this week in the New York Times about how eight many people, millions of people are not going and getting their second shot of their vaccine. Uh, in reality, it was 8%. 92% were following through and getting their second vaccine. So that is incredibly successful, but the way it was framed in the most prominent media outlet in the country uh, was through non-compliance. And so it creates perceptions in readers that people might be resistant or hesitant to get their second shot. Um, and so it's a misperception that creates a false norm. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is leadership. And, and so again, in Steve's talk, he under, underscored the importance of leadership. And, and he drew on this large literature of identity leadership. Um, I wanna say that, it, it, and this is what I've been studying as well about uh, in many countries around the world, looking at how national identification can predict adherence. And it turns out it's a very strong predictor in pretty much every country around the world that we've studied. We have data from 67 nations. Um, 
But there are places where identity leadership fails. And I am uh, sitting in one in New York City right now where the, one of the big problems in the lack of the collective resilience in the US was due to a failure of leadership. Uh, so under the previous president, Donald Trump, uh, in a polarized environment politically, um, rallied people in a way that, that led members of his party to continually resist pretty much every element of the pandemic. So uh, the data from the first wave suggested that Republicans didn't take the pandemic as seriously and study after study found this. Uh, then, and the, I have run a massive study on this myself, looking at how people move around the country. We found that in parts of the country that were more Republican, were less likely to engage in spatial distancing. And this was over and above economic factors, race, ethnicity, population density. Um, and there's other research suggesting that Republicans were less likely to wear masks when those were the public health recommendation. And some of them saw that as a signal of their identity, of their loyalty to the president to not wear a mask when they were being recommended to wear one. And now we're seeing it with vaccine hesitancy. The single biggest predictor in this country of vaccine hesitancy is identification with the Republican party. And so you see a, a thread throughout every phase of the pandemic, throughout every mitigation strategy, um, that it's been carved up by political identity rather than a shared sense of purpose and national identity. And so that here has led to over, you know, contributed, I think, significantly to over 500,000 people who've died due to COVID uh, just in this country alone. And, and what this all suggests is that managing social norms and understanding the political and social context are going to matter a great deal, not just for this pandemic, but for future crises. And then the, the final thing here is we've talked a lot about the benefits of a shared identity, a, a national identity. I, I want to say that it's also useful for us going forward to think about moving up even a further level of identity to a global identity. And so this is one of the challenges right now as, as we look around the world and we see the, the crisis and the massive outbreak in many parts of the world, uh, like India and, and, and Brazil. Um, what we're seeing is that some of the resources are only being shared within national boundaries. So for example, vaccines. And so we, if we're gonna solve this, if we're gonna deal with this problem and future problems, uh, you know, I can think of the biggest one on the horizon is gonna be global climate change. We have to think more about what we can do to not only leverage national identities, uh, but create a sense of global identity or at least shared responsibility for people in other nations. And I do want to say that this is not opposed to having a national identity. Part of your national identity, part of who we are, can be supporting other people around the world in crisis, uh, means helping out and, and being an ally. And so we need to think not about uh, eroding national identities, but cultivating national identities uh, that are more inclusive and take into consideration care for people in other parts of the world who are uh, facing these challenges as well. So I'll wrap up there. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jay. Wonderful comments. Conscious of time, I'm not going to say anything except that all the commentators gave great insights, and I'm going to invite Stephen to respond to their questions and insights. Steve. Yeah. So I just wanted, well, first of all, I mean, so many rich insights and so many rich comments that if if we discussed this for a week we wouldn't get to the bottom of it and i very much hope we can continue this conversation in some form or another outside um, this meeting but I, do, I just want to start with a few general points i mean the first thing is for me you know it, 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 it's a bit like dickens in a tale of two cities identity is the best of worlds and the worst of worlds um, there are general identity processes about for instance, solidarity of the in with the in group, um, and uh, not extending that solidarity to the out group, but the way in which that plays out in any society is going to be a function of how we construct those particular identities. I often give the example. Uh, uh, I did some work years ago on the rescue of Bulgarian Jews during the Holocaust, and and Bulgaria uh, was one of those countries. In fact, the only country under Axis rule where not a single Jewish person was deported to their death. And in fact, twice people mobilized to save Jews from, from deportation by the Nazis. And I, I often contrast, in 1934, the Nazis uh, came out with a booklet called The ABC of National Socialism. And uh, basically, uh, it was written by uh, Goebbels, and he said, what is the first commandment of National Socialism? It is love thine ethnic comrade as thyself. So it's love for the in-group, but the in-group, Germany, is defined ethnically. 
so that Jewish people lie outside its boundaries uh, and are seen as a threat to it. Okay? And when you look at the discourse in Bulgaria, you find again this discourse of um, we have to love Bulgarians, but there Jewish people are talked about as Bulgarians. In fact, they're hardly ever talked about as, as Jews. They're talked about as a, national, as a national minority. And if they're talked about as Jews, it's to stress that they, um, you know, they, they sing the same folk songs as us. They have the same folk heroes. Uh, they, they revere Slaviakov and Pencho and so on and so forth. So actually it's the same process, but the content, the definition of the boundaries of the group and the norms of the group, because in the Bulgarian case, uh, the norm is solidarity um, with, uh, with those who are underprivileged. And finally, the group interests are defined in different ways. And so the work is done in the way in which we define um, the group. And I think that's absolutely critical. And one of my uh, interests is in the issue of the construction of, 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 uh, of category boundaries and category content. To talk about generic identity processes without taking account of the specific ways in which identities are created um, um, is, it, it doesn't get you very far. And actually it's rather telling um, in my domestic context, because as I say, I live in Scotland. Um, now, England, the problem about in for England in terms of identity is that English identity is generally understood in ethnic terms. To be English uh, generally goes along with a sense of you know, being white, effectively. Whereas in Scotland, over the last 15, 20 years, the Scottish National Party has constructed an inclusive um, ethnic, uh, sorry, civic nationalism, in which anybody who lives in Scotland and is committed to Scotland is seen as Scottish. I'm seen as a new Scot. And it is interesting that in Scotland, around COVID, the slogan, um, uh, you know, do this this is Scotland, this is Scottish, can be used in a way you could never use it in England because you would be exclusive, you'd be ethnically exclusive, it would be racist. So, so as I say, these issues of the construction of national categories, which again, as Craig has stressed for us, then brings in issues of history and structure and institutions becomes absolutely critical. Um, so I think that's the first point I want to make. I don't want to be naive about identity. I don't want to essentialize identity. I don't want to essentialize the outcomes. As I say, I think there are certain processes, but the way those play out is utterly dependent upon the construction uh, of, 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 um, of the nature of those categories. I want to pick up a couple of other points. Um, I, I completely agree with, you know, with, uh, with Jay's point about, about the importance of the behavioral dimension in very, very practical ways. I was talking about, you know, the literature about group processes and health. And when you look at the impact of those group processes, so for instance, one study shows that membership of one social group decreases your chances of being depressed in five years time by 20%. And if you're a member of two, three, four, five groups, it goes up to 50%. That is about 10 times stronger than any pill that has ever been invented. The power, the prophylactic power of these social processes is incredibly powerful. And I mean, people begin to talk about social prescribing. Well, we should be socially prescribing group membership because it's so good for your health. It's so powerful for your health. And one of the biggest things we need to be concerned about, I think, is social isolation, the atomization of our society. I hope it brings it very much up the agenda because when people you know critique the atomization of society the consumerization of social relations they tend to do it as a political critique of new neoliberalism well that's great but i think one can also add to it look what are the social costs of such atomization what are the implications and what do we need to do about it there are issues i mean in the 2019 election in the UK, Jeremy Corbyn was seen as madly left-wing for suggesting that everybody gets free Wi-Fi. Now people are talking about it as if it's self-evident, as a human right, it's a way of being connected, that when you look at the mental health costs and say the education costs during the pandemic, they were far higher to ethnic minorities and deprived communities because they couldn't study at home, because they couldn't have Zoom calls with their families, because they were socially isolated. So uh, uh, raising these issues, understanding the costs of, of them, making it 
a key, a key criterion when one's talking about health and public health, to me, is immensely uh, important. And I very like, much like um, Rifka's uh, notion of uh, of an impact assessment. Um, I also quite like the notion of, of the idea of identity capital. Um, it's close to social uh, social capital, but it does um, talk about the uh, some of the mechanisms um, involved. But absolutely, understanding that when you break down that identity capital, it is bad for people, including their physical health. So as I say, I, I hope the issue of isolation and atomization, the ways of overcoming it, moves way up the social and political and research agenda. I want to finish by coming back to the issue. Actually, it's an, it, 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 it's an issue which Shanaz raised about a, a liberatory um, social psychology, but it relates to what I think everybody was saying. If you look at the context in which modern psychology was, was formed, very much like most of the social sciences, it was in the context of industrialization and the formation of mass society. And as many people have pointed out, the key political and social question raised by the rise of mass society is the question of social order. The question of how could you go from small, intimate village societies where those in uh, charge, you know, had direct control over, um, you know, over the peasants to a to a mass society in cities where, you know, the, the middle classes and the working classes were separated and they hardly ever saw each other, uh, you know, in, at least in the, uh, in, in, the, in the domestic sphere and that huge fear that the masses would all, would develop alternative ideas and that they would um, they would challenge the status quo, and so the mass was pathologized as this uh, this mindless, seething, dangerous, immoral uh, um, space, and the mass in action was the crowd. Crowd psychology was an expression of all those nineteenth century elite fears of the mass and the power of the mass when they came together in the crowd. So collective psychology is effectively, uh, I think, an expression of the, of, you know, of the fears of liberation, of the fears of equality, uh, because of course the powerless gain their power through their, um, uh, through their combination. And not only that, the notion it's in, in anti-collectivism that people lose agency and become sheep-like misses the point, of course, that for most people in this world who live in unequal power relations, they only um, are empowered and only are agentic and only make their own fate um, when they come together collectively in social movements and in crowds. And if one place proves that, um, it's South Africa and the anti-apartheid movement. It's also why actually uh, South African psychology, I think historically has been some of the best social psychology in the world. And if I wanted to talk about one book, although it's an old book, it's that old book by Don Foster and others, Social Psychology in South Africa, because it understands and writes about those issues because they are so alive. So I do think that the notion of collectivity is pathologized for very political uh, reasons. I think it's really important to challenge that, to show the empowering and powerful nature of the group, and also to raise those issues of how groups, actually people are um, emotional in groups and people are positive in groups, not because they're mindless and they, 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 they lose reason, but because they're empowered in groups and they create their own fate and they create their own history. I still remember, I, I, I run a seminar on crowd behavior for my students. Uh, I remember one year, they, they, I, I always tell them to go out, experience the crowd event. And one year they came back and, and they were in tears. Now, yeah, perhaps my teaching is bad, but students are normally in tears. Um, and I said to them, well, yeah, why, why, why are you in tears? They said, look, we went to the Make Poverty History demonstrations in Edinburgh when the G7 was in Scotland. They said, and for the first time in our lives, we weren't being told what to do by governments, we were telling governments what to do. And that for me sums up the potential power uh, of the group. So for me, the issue of a liberatory psychology and the issue of a, um, a collective psychology, but not any old collective psychology, a collective psychology which is attentive to the boundaries and the inclusivity and exclusivity and the norms of those collectives is, is an absolutely central project. And, you can't separate out the two. 
Um, there were many other wonderful points that I haven't had time to respond to. So I have written them down and I will be thinking about them over, over the coming days and weeks. So thank you very much. So thanks you, thank you for engaging the really good questions from the three different uh, colleagues on this. Uh, as you said, there's lots more to engage and it's a terrific conversation. I now want to um, act as the mediator of bringing some of the wider audience into that conversation. We have many uh, different very good questions, but I think we won't be able to deal with them all. So I'm going to pick and I apologize to the people who asked other good questions. But the first is, can you bring gender more to the forefront of this discussion? Um, let me amplify slightly by saying we could add race and other things, but gender is a really important focus here. Um, and it seems to me it comes in as a potential external categorization. We speak about women as objects of research, as an object of identification, self-understanding related to things you're talking about. But I think the question is partly, can it be a core dimension of understanding the variability of the self, the person, the actor of the psychology itself, not just an attribute? I mean, in, you can answer that question at two levels. I mean, first of all, one of the core notions of the social identity approach is that we all have mul multiple social categories and which social category is salient will be a function of context. And clearly, in many ways, the identities we hold in any given context are, are a statement about the organization of the social uh, world. So there are contexts which are fundamentally gendered and therefore gender identity is going to be the four. So in, in, in a way, talking about the social category is bound up with a statement about the representation of the organization of the social world. It's, it's a positioning in a world which is, which is organized along those lines. Um, but then, I mean, many worlds are not necessarily primarily um, organized around gender and so I if I go into different contexts which are around organized around um, different social categories so my identity might change and one of the uh, uh, claims and I think there's plenty of data to suggest this is that you know that the, the, the human subject is multiple and we are you know in different spaces um, we behave, um, we value things, we relate to people in fundamentally different uh, in different ways. So certainly gender is a really important social category because so much of our world is structurally gendered. The second uh, qu question, which is sometimes raised, is are women more likely to see themselves in collective terms than men? And there, I think that's a more of a fraught um, uh, debate because it, it to, to my sense um, you can have a collective identity which has got individualistic values such that the more that you identify with that category um, the more you behave in in line with those values and very early on there was a study by one of the uh, 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 early and, and very important social identity theorists Rupert Brown in which he showed that sort of uh, uh, it, bakery delivery workers um, when they acted in terms of their group identity, um, were much more individualistic and didn't see each other as homogenous. Now that led to a big debate about whether social identity leads to homogeneity or not, but it missed the point that actually, you know, this is a, if I can use the term, a sort of a petty bourgeois individualistic category which values particular things. So the collective identity was to stress those individualistic values more when they behaved in terms of that group identity. So I think we've got to draw a distinction between the group identity and the values and the forms of behavior which come about. And the paradox is certain collective identities may lead us to valorize individualistic uh, values more and therefore behave in those particular ways and that's the way in which I would argue that's where gender comes in because I do think that the ideologies of gender we, means that when women behave in terms of a gendered social identity they value communal more norms more than men who might identify collectively just as much but notions of masculinity uh, are less communal in those particular forms so I'm drawing a distinction 
between, if you like, the identity and the identity content and particular forms of it, which is another way of saying that I think gender is absolutely fundamental, but I think we've got to be quite careful and quite analytic about the different levels at which it operates. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. And speaking of identity, I failed to say that was a question from Sarah Moore about gender. Let me invite any of the other panelists who have um, additional comments they'd like to make on this issue of gender. Okay, I'm interpreting this as applause and a sense that Steve just adequately covered absolutely <laughs> everything in this huge and complex uh, problem, um, which is, uh, in fact, an interesting area for research. You can go back to Jay's core point. This opens up so many avenues where research is needed, and I'll just add, and where the integration of different research streams is crucial. I think that's something we've been hearing here. Let me ask another question that comes up. Um, will shared identity decline after the crisis? Maureen Severin um, draws from your uh, presentation a sense that if there's something positive in the crisis, it is the extent to which it produced for many <coughs> strong identifications, um, social identifications, community and others. Um, are these going to decline as the severity of the crisis ebbs, or is there anything we can do about this? Mm. Well, I don't think these things are inevitable. And I mean, Jay was quite right to raise climate change. Um, I mean, in Scotland, for instance, um, COP26 um, is, is meant to happen in November with 131 states of uh, heads of state uh, coming. Now, the issue of what we learn from the pandemic and how that feeds into the notion of climate change and what identities we build are absolutely critical. I mean, I, I, I tend to think as a social scientist that I, I dislike um, not, not predictions around particular relationships, but um, you know, prof prophesying the future in many ways. And I think the paradox of prophesying the future is that uh, the more you prophesy something is going to happen and make it inevitable, you more demobilize people from doing the things which are necessary to make it uh, happen. And so it, it doesn't happen. Um, so to, to my mind, the question is actually understanding more what the processes and what the factors are which lead to, um, uh, to shared identity and using those to try and build uh, upon it. I mean, I, I tend to think that these things are humanly made uh, and therefore it's contingent and it's in our hands. Anyone of the other panelists wish to add on this? Yeah, I'll add one thing. There's research on this, that it's incredibly hard to make effective predictions. Um, so so what, what we do know is we know if certain factors occur, that that'll facilitate a shared collective identity. Or if other factors occur, you can divide people up. Um, but we don't know what the key players, um, which is you know us, but also the media, political elites, leaders, are going to do after this. And, and clearly there's gonna be some people who try to divide people for political and personal benefit, um, especially like author authoritarian style leaders usually attempt to capitalize on chaos and, and inequality and uh, the type of deprivation that happens after a situation like this. But it doesn't have, I think the key thing is it doesn't have to be that case. Um, and, and that it's important to understand that there are factors you can use to mobilize people to build a sense of solidarity. Um, let me add a comment to what Jay just said, which is there's very good research, as he suggested, showing how hard people find it to um, predict the future accurately. Um, there's also very good research suggesting this does not stop them from constantly predicting the future inaccurately and making that the basis for their actions. The um, other panelists on this, let me yeah. go on to them. Yeah. On remark, uh, I'm, I was wondering this social identity, it could be that the pandemic has strengthened that and uh, there's certainly some evidence or ev lots of evidence for it. Um, I, I think there's also evidence that, that there have been cracks in this solidarity already. And I think at the international level, I do not have the impression that there's such a strengthened social identity at the international level. I don't know if, if you can say anything about that. 
because what we've seen is actually the vaccine nationalism, every, every country for itself and closing borders and so on and so forth. So yeah, I don't know if you have a remark on that. And we had other questions about this issue of um, well-endowed countries, poor countries, what kind of obligation? And it raises an issue of, of sort of the normativity that runs through the discussion alongside the science. You know, the what should we do questions become in many ways uh, normative. And so both within countries and especially among countries, how do you see this issue of identity strengthening a response across um, these big categories like rich countries and poor countries? Um, how do you see it getting in the way? Hmm. Well, I mean, let me use just one example. Um, I mean, when you look at exclusion, one of the biggest categories which is excluded are migrants. And I think in part, that's because the very definition of a migrant is as somebody who is other, not only to your nation, but to the system of nation states. They're, they are uh, people defined by movement um, in uh, a system which is defined by place, right? So they're the quintessential other. As I say, they're not only out group in, in the sense that they're from another group within a category system, they lie completely outside the category system. There was a brief moment in the UK at least, and perhaps elsewhere, I don't know how this played around the world, when that changed. And it was about a, a photograph of a young boy, uh, Island Kurdi, uh, who drowned um, uh, um, coming to Greece. Um, and, 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 and the image was as a father of a father gazing at his child. And it was heartbreaking. And it was heartbreaking because it positioned you as that father. Anybody who was a parent, who could imagine what they would feel when seeing that. I mean, it was just indescribably powerful and poignant. But the point is, it didn't change our attitudes to migrants, it changed the category system. Um, we, we stopped thinking of people in terms of migrants. For once, um, this, this child was a child. Um, he had his humanity brought back and, and the parent was a child as well. So. I, I think there are a number of, of, of issues and ways of positioning. Um, I mean, one way, as, um, as Jay said, is to think in terms of uh, a, a broader human category, but one can also draw on other categories which bring us together. I mean, as I say, a, a category of a parent uh, to a child and, 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 and so on. And I think there are certain categories and category systems which are very difficult um, to, uh, to reconfigure. Um, as I say, the whole notion of migrant, I, I, I think it is difficult to have positive relations to migrants because you always position them as outgroup necessarily. And you can have a sense of, okay, we can be nice to outgroups, but they're still outgroups rather than reconfiguring uh, uh, the groups themselves. Um, so I suppose my point is just simply, I think there are ways and means of doing it. Um, and I think there might be creative ways and means of doing it, um, which might be more successful than simply trying to have a generic category of humanity. Because humanity, uh, work on social representations, um, makes a really, some really nice points about how we conceptualize and understand phenomena. It talks about two concepts, anchoring, which is the way in which we understand the new in terms of the old, and concretization, turning an abstraction into something which is concrete and understood through images and metaphors and so on. As I say, for me, humanity is a, it, it, it's something of an abstraction, but something like being um, you know, a parent is built into all sorts of concrete forms of sensibility and images and, and the like. And perhaps, um, you know, we can, we, we can build on, on those as well. Because, you know, when I look at those pictures of India, and I, I read the Arundhati Roy piece this morning, and it's, it is utterly heartbreaking. Um, uh, it also, of course, makes the point that this is a human-made uh, tragedy, and like so many things, turning it into a thing of nature is a way of avoiding responsibility for, uh, for it happening and doing things uh, about it happening. But you relate to it. I find I find myself relating really concretely to it through those, um, you know, the, the, the particular experiences they were going through, which mapped onto my experience. Mm -hmm. 
So, so I think we can reconfigure the, the categories, but I think doing it in a way that makes it more concrete and allows us to relate to those experiences is something that we can build on. Good. Let me throw out that the, a relationship of this, something you said in your talk, something that Rifka highlighted in the notion of actor being a more variable concept than it's sometimes taken as. And one of Jay's points about nationalism, which is that we can want to be better persons and try to make ourselves better. Um, we can want our communities to be better and less exclusive, and we can imagine a better rather than a worse nationalism, a um, more solidaristic, less bellicose one. So that um, there is an issue running through this of the potential at every scale for human beings to be engaging in um, efforts of transformation of themselves in some degree. Yes, fair. I mean, I think that is fair. And just coming back to Jay's point, I mean, in England, nationalism, uh, defining yourself in more in terms of English or British, um, which are often interchangeable, uh, is it, correlated with being anti-migrant, uh, anti-immigration. In Scotland, it's the other way around. In Scotland, um, actually, the more that people define themselves as Scottish, the more they are pro-migrant. Uh, now, you can explain that on various levels, but I do think, again, it comes down to the content and the meaning of, 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 of those uh, identities. It can't be done quickly. It's a, it's a long-term historical construction. In part, it comes about because the SNP to win power needed the votes of people like myself. So it began to reconfigure um, uh, the meaning of nationhood. Um, uh, so, so it's not just you know, an easy short-term psychological fix, but certainly I think the work can be done to reconfigure the meanings of national identities, to, to give them uh, both to make them more inclusive in terms of boundaries and more pro-social in terms of, uh, uh, of norms. Let me pose a last question to the, the whole group, and then I will invite <coughs> There's just things that are important to say that haven't been said, give everyone a chance. The last question is something that runs, it's formulated very uh, directly by Hadil Fahid, but it's also raised by others. How do we translate this analysis of what's going on into action to improve mental health? Um, and I think some things are in, implicit, Steve, like um, social isolation is one of the factors in depression and so forth. But can, are there more general answers for thinking about this in relationship to the project of much of psychology of improving mental health? There was a project last year by, by the Royal College of, 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 of Psychiatrists in, in the UK. And um, it's called social scaffolding. And um, it, it takes these principles, largely these principles of the so-called social cure, and it tries to uh, apply them in terms of um, uh, building a new social model of health. What I mean, and, and in many ways, I think that's the question. People recognize that mental health is social. There hasn't been a very good social model of uh of of health and i think <coughs> the notion of social scaffolding i like and i actually think it relates to something which uh which rifka said about you know what has the pandemic taught us about the relationship between state and society because certainly in western liberal democratic societies we've had a choice between sort of rather paternalistic uh politics um, in which the state does things for people and a, a, a sort of a more neoliberal conservative politics in which the state retrenches and leaves people on their own to look after themselves. And, and the argument about social scaffolding is it's saying, look, people can self-organize and people uh, need to self-organize, but that's something which requires resources and requires support of, of, of all sorts of forms, whether it's meeting places, whether it's childcare, whether it's uh, you know, buildings with good access so that women can attend and disabled people can attend and so on and so forth. That, that scaffolding is not the state basically retreating and, and cutting back on the welfare state. It's actually a, a, a form of welfareism which doesn't substitute for people's self-organization. And I think one of the things that comes out of this pandemic is 
you know, I, I, I talked at the beginning that the model had been that the uh, that the public would be a problem for government. I think if I had to say one headline out of this pandemic, on the whole, it's been the other way around. It's been, been publics who've been quite magnificent dragging governments behind them. I think it's shown the remarkable ability of that self-organization, but it's falling apart for, for just for concrete reasons. The reason why, for instance, shared identity is, 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 is becoming problematic in part is because, you know, if you've got to work and to do these uh, and take part in mutual aid groups at the same time, there's so many hours in the day and people just get exhausted and therefore they need to be funded and they need to be supported and they need, you know, all these other resources like, like, like Wi-Fi for, for, for everyone. So for me, the message, which isn't just about mental health is about healthy society is thinking in terms of scaffolding the self-organization of people both because that gives them the psychological resilience but also because it empowers them in practical terms to be able to come up with with concrete uh, outcomes that they're in their in their interests and i think if as i say if there's one big message for society that comes out of this it is you know scaffold people's self-organization Right, which, which of course raises the questions that Shanaz put on the table most directly about structures of power and oppression um, that keep the system away from doing that in many settings, all settings, I think, in different degrees. Um, all right, we're almost at the end. Do any of the panelists um, have um, a point that they would like to add in closing? Let me go around. Rivka. Yes, I would like to, to say something about uh, the mental health uh, issue. So one one way of getting more attention, more funding for mental health is, of course, to to show the, the tremendous economic costs that mental health problems uh, generate. And this is, of course, something that's been going on for the past decade uh, to, to get that, that on the agenda and so on. But what I see in the debate about that is very much a focus on how mental health relates to productivity and how that becomes more important in our current economy where everyone is doing knowledge work and resource work, emotional work and so on and so forth. Uh, what I don't see, so, so and, and I see then, you know, we should have more mental health care, but we should have personal coaches, we should have all kinds of things. Uh, what I don't see is uh, an attention from economists for these yeah, more structural, infrastructural sources of mental health, such as the, the scaffolding and, and, but also just, you know, the plain old socioeconomic variables that we know uh, are related to, to mental health and mental health problems. Uh, you know, this, this connection is not uh, very strong in, in the economic discussion about mental health and what to do about it. And it, it's, economics is still very dominant a way of, of you know getting things on the policy agenda uh, it has some dangers in itself but uh, it would be great if if we could get that into the discussion also um yeah in economics and economic policy makers because they are still quite dominant in in policy uh, in, in the overall policy uh, arena including health and social uh, security and so on and so forth so that, that's one remark i wanted to make <coughs> great thank you Shanaz, anything you want to add before we close? Okay, you're muted, but if you're saying no, you don't have to unmute. <laughs> thank you. Jay? Yeah, I'll just thank all the speakers and the commentators and the participants for coming and sharing their thoughts and questions. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, let me pick up in that spirit of thanks. Um, first, uh, thanks to the ISC as an organization. And let me note about this that this is part of a series that is foregrounding individual disciplines, but not in order to keep them individual, but in order to um, think about the way each contributes to interdisciplinary and broader dialogues and understanding um, and to policy. The uh, thanks goes also to the International Union of Psychological Sciences, um, uh, and to Seth Cooper, who is with us personally, um, leading that. Um, the um, staff of the ISC here represented um, first by David Kaplan, um, Alison Meston, uh, Zenia Tsoi, all did good work in supporting this seminar and getting it organized. Heide Hackman and the rest of the leadership at the ISC has uh, created a, um, I think, really strong engagement um, in advancing our public communication through these efforts. 
And um, finally, let me thank all of the attendees um, who didn't all get a chance to ask their questions or to speak directly, but they should not feel socially isolated, neglected, we appreciate you. And, and above all, Steve, thanks for a terrific talk. Thank you.